take every opportunity. So firstly, you have to show a lot of respect to everybody that you meet, I think, regardless of the time of your life. Um, but take every opportunity. So it might not seem like, as I mentioned before, you graduate from university and you want to be a director. Well, that's wonderful. But you have no experience, and I'm not going to give you a million dollars or more to go and direct a movie. Um, so what are you going to do to get yourself to that, that point, that level? <coughs> Hi, I'm Tosca Musk with Passion Flicks, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with Tosca Musk. Tosca, thanks for coming to our studio. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? That is such a difficult question to ask, answer. Uh, I, uh, I, I actually, I really don't know how to answer that question. How did I get this job? I. So I wanted to always make great positive stories about two people communicating who connect and compromise in relationships, any two people. And um, I was struggling finding a place where I could create these um, and show them. Um, a lot of networks weren't necessarily interested in making romance novels into movies. I really like romance novels. I feel that they are very empowering emotionally to uh, men and women. And so I wanted to make them. So my partners and I at the time, um, we, because we couldn't find a place that would actually distribute these movies, we decided to create our own distribution platform. And uh, that distribution platform is Passion Flicks. So basically it's like a Netflix for women focused on taking best-selling romance novels and turning them into movies and series. And we release them alongside curated content from the studios that we license as well, very specific movies that we all love. Um, and so that's how I have this job. I needed to distribute content that was very, very, that resonated well with me. There was nowhere else for it to go, so I created the platform. That was excellent. Um, let's let's go back in time a little bit to okay. young Tusco when, yeah. when you were growing up. What did you want to be when you were a little girl, thinking about what you'd do as a career growing up? You know, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, when I was about four or five, I watched Xanadu with mm. Olivia Newton-John. Sure. And uh, I saw her disappear and reappear, and I came home and I said, that's what I'm going to do when I grow up. I'm going to uh, make movies and make people disappear and reappear. That now, was a goal. For those who don't know, you know uh, much about your background, so where are you from, and you know, tell us. Uh, I'm from South Africa. I was born in Pretoria. I watched Xanadu when I was in Durban, I believe. So we lived in Pretoria, then Durban, then Bloemfontein, then Johannesburg, then moved to Toronto, then Vancouver, San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles, all over the place. Um, and so this was when I was in, Johannesburg, uh, in Durban. I watched Xanadu, came home, told my mom I was going to be this person that made people disappear and reappear. So I really should have gone into visual effects, but at the time I didn't realize that. Um, I went into acting, which makes no, no sense whatsoever. Um, but I did acting for a while. Um, and then after doing acting... Was it scripted or did you do commercial work? Uh, scripted. Uh -huh. It was scripted. Yeah, so I did um, theater and um, you, there wasn't really much of an opportunity to do on-screen stuff in South Africa. Um, and so it was more, my mother was a model, is a model still, and um, so I did some modeling, so that's the sort of on-camera stuff I did, otherwise I did theater. Um, now were your parents very supportive when you kind of told them that you wanted to go into a career in, in the arts? Um, did they, I'm always curious, yeah. and you sort of come from a, a, a family that has a bit of a reputation and name, and I'm curious about you know, how that whole family dynamic influenced your career path. But like, were they saying, no, 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 you should become a doctor or go into law, or were they very supportive? You know, everyone in my family is very supportive of whatever you choose to do, as long as you, ex you know, do everything you can to excel in it. So that's a very fortunate thing. My mother, I think, didn't really pay it much attention. She just went, okay, great, whatever you want to do, sounds good. Um, just work, <laughs> just work hard, um, in a very positive way, but, uh, you know, I was the artsy one in the family. I was the only girl, 
Um, they're, they're, I have two older brothers. Mm -hmm. and, um, so you're the baby. I'm the baby mm -hmm. and the only girl. And so for, for everyone, it was sort of, I, I guess at that point, it was kind of expected that I was going to be dancing around and wearing the princess dresses and acting. Um, and so it was, it was just accepted. And so where did you go from there? Did you pursue that in college? You do it kind of, you know, on your own path, on your own time? So I did theater all through high school, and I actually stage managed for a Shakespearean theater company, which was very interesting. And then prior to starting university, I worked for Alliance Communications in Toronto. Um, and I continued to work for them every summer between university, uh, between, between university years. And um, that was an incredible experience. One thing that I say to every single person that comes to even apply for a job at Passionflix is I want you to work in every single department. You might want to come and you're going to, you want to be a producer. That's great. But if you don't know anything about distribution, about marketing, about merchandise, about uh, content licensing, you won't actually know really what to do. You need to touch on every single one. And also, you'll have a lot more respect for everybody that works in those departments. So I'm insistent that if you want to come and you want to be a producer at Passion Flix, great. We're going to start you in merchandise. That is such great advice. I mean, I feel the exact same way. Um, and, you know, it's maybe subtle if you missed it. I want to just underscore that for the audience, that you really do have to be a practitioner, right? Like, especially when you're starting your own company. Yeah. Um, you do everything from take out the trash to write the paychecks. Yes. Um, but to be able to, you know, do every single job uh, and have an understanding of it is super, super great advice. I love that. Yeah. Um, and it's you also, it's a lot more enjoyable, I think, when you know what everybody else has to go through. Um, it creates a lot more of a community in the office. And, you know, if, if somebody... You know, if you have your particular responsibility and then somebody else has their particular responsibility, but that person's falling a little behind on theirs, but for the benefit of the company, person A can jump in and help person B with a very positive attitude. Oh, I know how to do that. Let me help you. What can I do? Um, and that just creates much more of a community within the office. Um, and, and the whole point of working, especially with a startup, the whole point of having that kind of team is that you can build the company together. It doesn't help if one department excels and the other one doesn't. The company will fail. You need all departments to rise together. Wow, that's great advice. I want to dig deeper into that. Um, before I do, I want to go back to, yeah. you know, this kind of it seems like a crescendo of you know getting great business experience, theatrical experience, production experience. Um, today, you're a director. Yes. Um, so, for our aspiring filmmakers. Um, what sort of advice would you give to the up, the up and comer thinking about getting into this business? What should they be studying now? Should they go into you know traditional Shakespearean you know mm -hmm. theatrics and, and learn the basics from the grassroots? Or uh, what advice do you have on that? Well, to direct, um, you know, you have to really love it. It's it's I thrive uh, on set when I'm directing. So there is no you know, I, I don't get tired. I, I can do a 14, I can do a 20 hour day if I was allowed to, but I'm not. Yeah. Um, and what is it that you love? Can you put your finger on the it? You know, it's really quite magical to, to take people and create the scene that was written on paper and bring it alive. There's something really magical about that. Um, you know, it, this, you know, hopefully is not taken the entirely wrong way, but I describe it to my children. I have five-year-old, uh, five-and-a-half-year-old twins, and um, my daughter, you know, really loves to play with her dolls, and my son loves to, you know, play Star Wars and all that sort of thing. Um, and when I describe it to them and they said, why do you always work? And I go, well, work is kind of play to me, much like you like to play with your dolls, and you create scenarios with your dolls, and you have this... Um, fantasy world that you come up with when you make up stories with the princesses and the, you know, Darth Vader, whoever it is that you're playing with, it feels like the same for me. I get to go and play with all these really enthusiastic people and willing people to create this, this story. Uh, so it's fun. I agree. And, and I think that's more great advice. When, when you love what you do, it doesn't yes. feel like work. Uh, I feel the exact same way. Um, let's go back into the it of 
uh, maybe some of the training, you know, for, for those who are maybe just getting through college and, you know, wanting to go into this kind of career, whether it's production in front mm -hmm. of the camera or behind the camera, um, what other advice do you have about what to learn now or what to do now to get the proper experience? Well, one thing that I like to encourage, and I think I touched on this earlier, is take every opportunity. So firstly, you have to show a lot of respect to everybody that you meet, I think, regardless of the time of your life. Um, but take every opportunity. So it might not seem like, as I mentioned before, you graduate from university and you want to be a director. Well, that's wonderful. You have no experience, and I'm not going to give you a million dollars or more to go and direct a movie. Um, so what are you going to do to get yourself to that, that point, that level? Um, that's a tough one. One, you want to study, you want to watch as many movies as possible, you want to read scripts, you really want to understand that, um, that heavily. It's helpful if you write a script as well. Um, writing really is an excellent um, jumping off point to, to the directing side of things. I'm not a writer. I can write, and I have rewritten many scripts, but I have never really spent a lot of time writing a screenplay from top to bottom. It's a lot of work. Um, I, I value all writers out there. Thank you. Um, but you know, if you were wanting to direct, uh, again, I say go into every department. So one way that I started off when I uh, got into physical production. So as opposed to com running the company, which is, the, it's like two different brains that I have. One is running the company, it's a distribution platform, um, we negotiate with studios, I option material, make lots of movies. And the other one is I go and get to make the movies. Um, when I started off, I worked, again, in every position that I could possibly get on a film set, and I volunteered. For weeks. Yeah, so your gaffer, your grip, Everything. your associate producer, you go get the coffee, whatever. Everything. Yeah. Um, I was an electric on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, working overnight for a week in uh, an old warehouse coming, coming out, uh, looking like a coal miner. I mean, it was just, it was a very different experience than, you know, this girl who played with dolls. And so, but I was lugging around cable and doing all the things that, you know, you learn what an electric does. I was a PA very briefly. I didn't spend too much time in the PA world. I should have done more, but um, I did extras wrangling. Um, I was very fortunate in Canada when I was doing some extras wrangling. I was allowed to be by the monitors and actually direct some of the background, which is a little unusual, but I got that experience, which was great. And I, I'll just mm -hmm. chime in. I, I so love where you're going with this because basically what you're saying is you have to be there mm -hmm. and then opportunities may or may not happen, right? Like, yes. So you, but you have to get yourself there first, be willing to take the job that's less glamorous than director on the back of this chair yes. and get your, you know, roll your sleeves up, get your hands dirty, go for it, and it sounds like things started to happen. But you also, you were you know, sort of plotting your, uh, your future as you learned all the basics, the building blocks of production. I think it's brilliant advice. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, while doing that, I also learned what is it, uh, you know, I would start studying things like um, how do you get a film off the ground? How do you raise money? How do you, where do you shoot? What is the tax credit system like in this place, in that place? How, what are the incentives in this state, this country? How can I tap into those things? Um, sometimes I was able to and sometimes I wasn't, but you have to know about them. It makes you a much more valuable person when it comes to producing. And and so the, the first thing I did is I, I was able to raise, here's some big advice, I was able to raise $280,000 for my first film, but the budget was $350,000. Don't make a movie if you don't have all the money. Adjust <laughs> the budget, adjust the, everything that you need to, but if you do not have all the money, don't start on that movie. So that was the biggest learning experience that I had because the movie never finished because I didn't get the extra $60,000 and I'd already shot the movie. Um, and well, so, what was your mindset? Did you think, oh, we'll, we'll get the rest? Or yeah. did you think we could do a lot with what we've got? No, if, if I had thought that I could complete the movie with $280,000, knowing now, I mean, I did this at 24, um, so if I had known that $280,000 was going to be the end of it, I should have 
gone and rebudgeted the movie and rescheduled the movie and included all the things that were needed in order to deliver in the $280,000. That's what I should have done. I did not. Um, I was a director on that one. I'm also a producer, um, and I had another producer on it. And we were just so green at the time, and we were just so excited about it. And of course, when you're 24, $280,000 is a lot of money. Now it's a lot of money. Anytime it's a lot of money. Um, but the budget was 350. So make sure you have that extra 70,000 or 60,000 or 50,000. Make sure you have all that money that you need to complete your project yeah. before starting. Good advice. Yes. Uh, what other mistakes can you think about that you've made along the way? Because you know, a lot of people will say, failure is not an option. Right? I hear mm -hmm. that phrase a lot. Yeah. But the reality is you can't have success without failure. Yeah. Right? It's, you know, um, as I get older, uh, you know, how do I become more wise or more experienced? It's because I made those mistakes. Hopefully I learned from a few of them. And now I have a little bit better judgment. Can you think of any other standout experiences that really taught you something? Yes. Well, I, I also say failure is not an option. Um, but, you know, I think that's also a definition of failure. What is failure? Failure to me is quitting and stopping to do it entirely. That's failure. Um, and if I choose to quit and stop doing it all entirely, then is it really failure? Or have I just chosen to do something else? So I, I think that it's all in the definition of failure. Um, but uh, mistakes, I mean, there are so many little bumps along the road. Um, one is, you know, surround yourself with people that know more than you do. I think everyone's heard that before. It is extremely valuable to have people who really know what they're doing supporting you, but also make sure that those people are there to support you and not to do something for themselves, which, you know, everybody's going to do something for themselves. But, um, you know, for example, I have a phenomenal DP. He's in his 60s. He's amazing. He's done six of the movies that I've done for Passion Flix, uh, or five of the movies. And um, I will continue to work with him. He's such an amazing person. He's very collaborative. He can make everyone look beautiful. He is extremely experienced. But he respects the hell out of me. And he would never challenge me if I said, this is how we're going to do it. And he would go, great. That's how you're going to do it. That's, we're, all, we're all on board. Yeah. And he will make sure that his entire team is all on board with how I want to do it. Um, well, and I suspect he suspects, uh, I suspect he respects you a lot as well. Absolutely. No, he has a massive amount of respect for me, which I think is really important. Yeah. And I respect everything that he does. So if he says, that's going to be very difficult, I'm not going to be able to do it. This is my reasoning for doing it. The time's not allowing us to do it. I don't have that kind of equipment, but I can try to do it this way. How about this? Mm -hmm. And he'll always come up with a solution, and it's really valuable. I have also worked with DPs, um, all, all of whom are very nice people, but I've worked with DPs who, while they're out there to work with you as a director and they're trying to get this film done, they're also shooting for their reel. And I'm sure you've heard that before, too. So um, they are going to spend all this time sh creating this beautiful shot that's not going to help you tell the story. Right. It's just a beautiful shot that they can ultimately put on their reel, but now I've just gone and wasted an entire day and I didn't tell my story. Now I'm rushing through the actual magic of the scene, the communication of the two talent, or, or however many talent are on your on your on camera. So you need to be able to focus on the meat of the story, and then you can focus on how beautiful you want to make it, or how those extra shots are going to be done. So two questions from that: um, How do you find that great trusted partner, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's your DP or your sound person or whatnot? Um, and then what do you do when you realize that they're just in it for them? How do you kind of course correct or do you? Um, I always course correct. So um, how do I find those people? Recommendations. There are people out there that will always say, I had a great experience working with a person. Um, and you want to meet those people immediately. Um, so that's how I met this DP. The first time we actually met, I wasn't able to hire him on the, on the first movie. But then I was able to hire him right afterwards. And it was just quite. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Um, a true professional, I'm sure. Uh, sorry? A true professional. A true professional, yeah. yes. And that's a big difference, I think. And, yes. and that's also a great little mini lesson is perhaps, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, sometimes 
whether we're trying to cut corners or mm -hmm. maybe it's a budget thing, we can't hire the level of professional that we want to. And there's quite a big difference between a true professional and an amateur, right? There is. I mean, I think there are also true professionals out there that will very happily come on board if they like the story and they will come on board for, you know, they're not going to charge you a lot of money. Um, so there's also something really wonderful about people that are more established in their career, so they may not need the money as much. Good point. So, um, you know, they have, they're in their union, they have their, you know, they have all their hours, whatever it might be, but also they've made money in the past. Um, and so they're able to be a little bit more flexible on rate. Um, so I would say always, always go for the top and um, see if you can convince them. And then, you know, n not necessarily say work your way to the bottom, but, but, you know, just always strive for the top, for the best people, the person that you really think is going to be able to help you tell the story. Okay. But make sure as a director that you get along with them. That's the number one thing. It can be somebody who has, who's just out of school who has a great eye and they're really good at their job. But if you don't get along with them and they don't have this, the right level of respect for you as the director, you're screwed. Yeah, I, another good, good point. Um, yeah, we've all been in that job mm -hmm. position where the person who you've hired to do it thinks that they can do your job better. Yeah. Or worse, you think that you can do their job better than they can, and yeah. neither one works, does it? No, it doesn't. And and so just to touch on course correction, so I'm a very big advocate for communicating. So. If there's any issue, any issue within the company, with uh, on set, with an actor, with an agent, wh whatever it might be, the only way to get past this uh, this bump is to communicate. Yeah. So if there's any position, and I've had an AD and I, a first AD is also very important. You're a director, you have a first AD and your DP, that's your team. They're with you all the time. Um, and I've had a first AD who, while I was directing stopped me from directing and said, I'm not ready yet, I need some time to do something. And I went, okay, interesting. That's not gonna happen again. Said my excuse me to the people that I was speaking to, took the AD off to the side, even though we were all ready to shoot, made everyone wait, went off to the side, and I had a com uh, my conversation with him, which is, this is my ship to sail. You don't actually have to be here. I appreciate your help. You are very good at what you do. But we have a very high level of respect for everybody that works on our sets. You don't speak to me that way. I don't speak to you that way. You don't speak to anybody that way. Mm -hmm. We all have to respect each other. This is a team effort. And only if the team works together will we have something great. Um, How did that go over? Very well. He immediately, he's like, I apologize. I will not do that again. Um, came back to set. Uh, and was remarkably respectful. I mean, that was in, on day two of the shoot and remarkably respectful for the rest of the shoot. Um, and, but I think you have to immediately address something when it's bothering you. And, and as the director, you know, you want to be, there's often this thing of like, oh, wow, I don't want to actually, you know, step on anyone's toes. And I need to be a little humble and all these things. Absolutely, humble, respectful, all those things. But you are the captain. Mm -hmm. You have to make those decisions. And whatever your decision is, is the one that goes. So you have to stand by it. Um, obviously, listen to the people around you if you're unsure. But stand by it and, and follow through. So like, great, that was perfect. We're moving on. Are you sure we have something else to do? Nope, I'm moving on. OK, well, we could have done this. I heard you. We're moving on. Yeah. And you move on. Decisiveness. It's very Confidence. important. Yeah. yeah, and that's great advice, whether you're a CEO of a company or in some sort of management role. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like you take full responsibility for the success and the failure. Yeah. It's your call. Um, I love that. That's, that's awesome. Um, I want to learn more about, you know, this, the, you know, how Passion Flix works. Mm -hmm. But because, well, I guess what I'm more curious about is how you arrived there. Because it, I'm sure you didn't just say, okay, we're just doing this. Um, mm, well, I believe it was that over tuna fish sandwiches, yes. Well, that's fair. But <laughs> maybe I ask it this way. Um, why not do it another way where you take a film? Like, listen, you're preaching to the choir, right? Mm -hmm. We are as fiercely independent as you can be, and we remain that way for lots of different reasons. Creative control is one of the main reasons. Um, I can list 100, but um, for just the sake of discussing it, so why not 
produce this film, you've got it greenlit for the budget, and then you take it and you're trying to sell it to a studio. Um, what pushback have you gotten, and, and why not go that route? Why go the sort of the reinvent the wheel route? Well, um, so it's not actually as simple as go and make this film and then um, sell it to a studio. The number of middlemen in between that who will take everything from you um, are a lot. And let's name who those, is this distributor? Uh, and producers, reps, sales agents, distributors, um, the studio itself. So, um, it, but not intentionally, everybody needs their cut because everybody has a job. So, uh, you know, if you're making a movie and you're using this movie as some way to market yourself and you don't care about ever getting any money back, then sure. <laughs> Great, go ahead. Um, but you raise money, so you as the individual, as the producer and director, are going out there and you're raising money from your friends and family. Um, generally speaking, a studio is not going to give you money to go and make the movie if you've never made one before. That, there are exceptions, absolutely, to that rule. But um, for the most part, we're all out there struggling to raise money to, to put together our films. So um, you go ahead. Do you have a... I was going to ask, mm -hmm. uh, just jump in here. So have you gone to your family f uh, and asked for funding? No. Because I wanted to ask that advice, yeah. too. I I'm on the same page. Mm -hmm. I, will, I don't hire my friends and family. Yeah. I don't work with them, and I never ask for money. Yeah. For obvious reasons, but I wanted to, you know, you, you had mentioned you, get, you go to your family for money, but N no, uh, in general. Other, yeah. Well, so my very first film, actually, my very first film, Puzzled, my, uh, my, both my brothers and my mother gave me money um, to produce my first film, which I think they gave to me in, uh, as a sort of master's degree education. Like, we could, we could send you to USC, or we'll give you money for this movie. <laughs> That's basically what it was. I, I was going to ask, so mm -hmm. uh, what's your recommendation on that? Do, do you take it as a gift, or do you take it as an investment? Like, oh, you know, thank you for that, but I, I plan to give you a 10% return, or maybe weigh in on that. I had a, well, when I first raised money for my first film, I had the full business plan, a full ROI, everything was planned out, how we were going to market it, you know, how everything was done. And I, I sat down in a boardroom and I presented it to my family. So you did all professional as if? Extremely professional. They were yeah. all like, wow, that's actually quite impressive. And I think I was 23 at the time. So so why did you decide to do it that way? Because that's a very deliberate decision. You know. Well, if you're going to learn, you have to do it the right way always. So even now, every single day, I, put, I continued to work on our business plan for Passion Flicks. Um, I was working on our new deck until midnight last night. Um, you continually re um, revise and review everything that you're doing to make sure that you actually understand the business. So the wonderful thing about a business plan is you should understand it. Don't try and make the business plan for somebody else. Make the business plan for you. Yeah. I need to understand this. I need to know. How am I going to make this? How much is it going to cost? How am I going to get my money back? How am I going to market this movie? Who is my audience? All of these things are really important, and they go in a business plan. So if you, as an individual, know these things, you are leaps and bounds ahead of everyone else. So. I was going to say another great example, and it's subtle too, is um, you sort of pitched to a very safe audience, even though you did it very professionally and all yes. buttoned up. Um, it's a, maybe a great little page from your playbook that other people can use is uh, you were ready, but you also pitched in front of an audience that you knew was somewhat sympathetic or empathetic I to your cause. I was shocked that they gave me money. I was absolutely shocked. I actually did not expect them to do it. I thought they would introduce me to somebody else. But what a great place to get all the wrinkles out, Yes. right? Like yeah. to experiment, yeah. use it as your laboratory. Yeah. That is fantastic advice, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, so that you got a little bit of uh, funding for that and then... Yeah. For my first film, yes, yeah. instead of uh, going to University. Oh, Can well, I went to university, but instead of getting a master's degree. Can I ask, too, because, you know, and I would probably ask um, the same question uh, from someone who comes from a family with a name mm -hmm. uh, like Musk. Is it easier or harder, do you think, with that last name? Uh, is it a liability or is it an advantage? Um, well, you know, that's a very interesting question. And weirdly enough, no one's actually asked that before, and they should. Um, so I'm very fortunate. You know, we have a wonderful family, and we've all, you know, grown up together, and we're all very close. So um, with regards to it being uh, something positive, it, it is positive. For, uh, I'm very fortunate that my family's doing a lot of great things in the world. So um, just having that kind of optimism in our lives is immediately great. Um, it opens a lot of doors, which is nice. 
um, it closes some others. But at the end of the day, if you are um, not able to prove yourself once those doors are open, it means nothing. So uh, let's talk about the doors that are closing. Why do you think they're closing? And maybe this is the liability part of that question or answer. Why are they closing? Um, well, generally speaking, it's people with money. Uh, it's in the funding world. And the doors are closing because they think that I'm a billionaire. OK, so it's all about the proof of concept or the, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the risk in giving money to someone like you? Yeah, it's a business. Yeah. So um, at the end of the day, um, I, I have to be able to, it, it's, it's wonderful to have doors opened by my mother and whoever it is, but um, it, it's wonderful to have doors open. And you should all, anybody that is out there looking to raise money, look at the people in your circle. Look at your dad, your mom, your uncle, brother, whoever it is, and say, do they know anybody that's connected to, connected to, connected to? And how can I jump up in that world? Is it through LinkedIn? Is it through an, a coffee? Um, and, and make sure that when you get that opportunity to speak to them, because you can get it. Every, everybody is not necessarily, um, you know, comes, not everybody comes from my family who have worked very hard to get where they are. Um, but, um, but everybody has a connection to somebody. I'm actually really glad mm -hmm. to hear you say that because uh, I, I know some people, um, and they're not in the spotlight like your family is, but their family is very successful. Uh, and I know a certain person who's had a chip on her shoulder her whole life and said, I'm never going to leverage um, the relationships or the success that my family has to move my career forward. And I, I, I always asked her, why, why not? Like, you're not going to ride the coattails. You're going to, you know, you're going to have to prove yourself, just like you said, when you get there. Mm -hmm. But like to have those doors open for you, why not take advantage of it? I think, you know, it just is a great leg up that not everyone has. Well, I think, uh, as I mentioned, I, I do think everybody has a, a little bit of a, an opportunity with everybody that they know. So even you getting to this position that you're on, I don't know how to get to having my own show here at YouTube space, I wouldn't even know how to go about it. But clearly, when you decided that you wanted to do this, you probably shot a pilot of your own, um, had an idea, had somebody connect you with somebody and you pitched it to them and then had somebody, con they connected you to somebody else and each single, each person takes you to another spot. It hones your pitch. It allows you to really understand your business plan and then here you are sitting here on a stage at YouTube, um, YouTube space. So. I think I don't necessarily just think that it's because of my family that we can get somewhere. I think every single person has one other person in their in their circle that can help them, that can give them that one introduction to even, you know, I work at Starbucks and, you know, my friend at Starbucks, he is also a DP and he wants to shoot something this weekend. Let's shoot a short film. Yeah. I mean, that's a step. And, oh, you know what, actually, and I know, let's put it up on YouTube. Oh, I know so-and-so that might be able to help us with some social media marketing. Yeah. All these things are beneficial. So I think look within your own circle to see who can connect you to that next step. But have your plan ready. Know what your plan is um, and understand your business. Yeah, it's great because you never know who you're going to get a chance to talk to. Yeah. Uh, would you put yourself in, if I could pin you down to put yourself in a category of introvert, extrovert, there's also ambivert, but where, what camp are you in? I'm an introvert. So am I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So as, as one to another, it can be very difficult to get out there and socialize. I don't yes. love the small talk. I have a very small group of very good friends. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sometimes painful, especially at parties. and different, I just don't do the schmoozing and all that very well. How have you been successful? I mean, have you just... Tell me, you know, give me some wisdom because I want to know personally. Yeah, um, I hate going to all those events. Yeah. Um, I have a very active mother who uh, forces me to go to all of those events, and and Michelle, who you've met, also um, <laughs> also forces me to go to certain events. Um, I hate it. I do not do well with small talk. I don't like standing in large rooms of people that I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult, but you do have to go. Um, if, if depending on on what you're looking for, you know, do I I don't go to those events and then you know tap on somebody's arm and go hi, 
Meryl Streep, nice to meet you. That wouldn't be my way of doing something. It's, I wouldn't recommend that at all either. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it's really important to show your face. Oh, Deep though. breath. Mm, mm, okay. Yes. Uh, you've worked a lot with actors, I'm sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there anyone in Hollywood that you can think of that you really admire? You mentioned Meryl, Meryl Streep, but like, um, do you get starstruck anymore, or do you have a deep admiration, and if so, for whom? I mean, so many people. There are so many incredibly talented people in Hollywood. I mean, everybody nominated for an Oscar this year. Yeah. And how about directors? Uh, is there someone in filmmaking that you admire, aspire, like you've, you've learned from their work that you'd like to, to mention? I'm a big fan of Baz Luhrmann. I don't normally, I don't make movies as colorful and as, as um, extra, extravagant as he does uh, in such a beautiful way, um, but one day I will. I, 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 you know, I, I find value in so many different directors, and I, that's why I say watch everything. Yeah. Um, and there are so many wonderfully talented people out there. Well, that's going to be my follow-up question is where do, you, where do you go for inspiration? So a lot of times... I'll see things out in daily life, whether it's nature or, you know, an urban environment. But how do you get inspired? You know, I'm very fortunate. I feel like I wake up inspired every day. I have two beautiful children that help me to see the world in a very different place each day um, who are excited about life. So I think children really help you. Um, I would say I'm pretty inspired in general every day. You know, Passion Flix is incredibly inspiring just innately because we focus so much on the positivity of people. And so when you concentrate each day on showing people in a positive light and looking at the positive outcomes of something and reading a story that has a positive relationship uh, and, ha and a, a positive ending, you, I think in general, I, I'm just inspired to, to bring those stories to light. I think there's so much negativity out there in the world and we spend so much time focused on negative content that I, I firmly believe that we, there is a place for positive content and we need to have that. Um, and positive is not religious, so I don't make religious content. There are companies that do that and they do very well. M my content is any religion, any sexuality, any age group, any um, ethnicity. I want them all. Um, love is love. Let's make things that are very positive. Let's show people in a positive role. Um, and, and, um, and so I think I'm just inspired by that idea every day. And, and so, uh, great, I'm on the same page with you. But let's dig into a little bit deeper of why that has become basically your life, your mission. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that so important to you? Um, again, I, I think I touched on it. The, um, there are so many stories out there that are wonderful stories, but they are, they are ultimately negative. They show people in a bit of a negative light, um, show people coming from a negative space or a depressed space or a sad space. Um, and while those are all very valid stories and they need to be told, I don't want to watch them because it brings me down. And I feel that there's so much out there that is that focuses on the, the negative side of things, yeah. that we need positive content. People see, people do. I want people to watch content and feel inspired and empowered to say the things that this character would say. Um, you know, that there's a lot of value in them speaking and coming from a positive place. Do you think that, um, that desire, that, um, that mission is influenced a lot from you being now a parent? Uh, very possibly, yes. Create a better world for your kids. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to have a boy and a girl, so I can see, um, you know, how each one is is, is um, affected by male and female influence and nature versus nurture, and they're twins, so they're like boy and a girl, like nature, definitely. Um, I do think that having children changed my outlook on life. I'm a lot lighter. There's, you know, um, I have a, I mean, at the end of the day, when you have children, you have a need to keep going. There is no, there's no choice. There's, there is no fail. Failure is not an option. Um, 
you have to keep going every day. You have to wake up, you have to feed them, you have to get them to school, you have to get them changed, you have to make sure that all these things are taken care of because you are responsible for two lives. Or, you know, and, um, and, so, and you want to make sure that they're brought up with a positive outlook in the world too. So I think, yes, there you go, yes. I guess it did affect me uh, in a more positive way. So final thoughts, final words of advice to people who want to sort of go their own path like you've done, mm -hmm. what would you say? I would say go for it. I think it is so wonderful that we have this opportunity and this ability for us to focus on the things that we really want to do. Um, I do think that there's an enormous amount of work. You need to know your audience and whatever you choose to do, whether it be a, a filmmaker or a car salesman, you need to know your audience and you need to be able to be laser focused on them. And so that's that's the one thing that I can highly advise for, to anybody. Even if you, you want to go out there and make a horror film, know your horror audience, know that particular genre. And what is it that your audience really wants from when they go and they watch something, one of your movies on Passion Flicks? So my genre and my I'm laser focused on romance. I think the romance is just ultimately the one thing that can, specifically for women, sorry, guys I really think should watch this too, but um, we crave it. And I really want to validate women's feelings. So everything I do is a, a, a validation of any kind of emotion. Um, I think there's so much strength in emotions. So with Passion Flicks, we are able to take these beautiful romance novels and turn them into movies and series and create this me time for women. Um, and, uh, and, and these passionate moments. Let's get a glass of wine, let's have a cup of tea, and let's sit down and watch a Passion Flicks movie. This is something that'll take you on a roller coaster ride of emotions. It'll help you dive into all of those emotions that you want to feel all day long. It'll end with a nice happy ending you're completely rejuvenated, then you get to go to sleep and wake up the next day and do it all over again. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Men should watch too. <laughs> I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. Like I say, man.